Amen. Man, Brian, great, great song, wherever Brian is right now. Great song. Isn't that a great song? Great message? Amen. Wow. I mean, I'm telling you, if you really listen to the words of that song, it's a powerful message of who God is and what he has done for us. And uh, I'm very excited to share that aspect uh, in the message today. If you weren't here last Sunday, uh, shame on you, but uh, other than that, uh, began a series of messages about, about really positioning ourselves for a spiritual awakening. It's time for an awakening. The, the title of the series is simply Awaken. And what I'm trying to do is position our church for something we're going to do in January together over three weeks. It's going to be a great experience. You need to be praying. You don't know what it is right now. Hang in there. In a couple of weeks, I'm going to tell you what we're going to do. And God's going to just, I believe, do a great work in this church because it's what he wants to do, number one. But he's faithful to his word. He's going to be true to his word. And if we do what he leads us to do in his word, not because a pastor is asking you to do that, because God is asking you to do that through his word, then if we do that, then God will bless that. God will, will, will do a work in your life, a fresh work in your life. For some of you, maybe the first time, that kind of work. All right, so, so we're talking about the need for a spiritual awakening. You know, sometimes, as I mentioned last Sunday, we find ourselves uh, that we're lacking something in our Christian life. Uh, it, it just seems to be boring. We're not getting anything from God. We're not hearing God. We ha don't have the power in our prayer life. We're not getting anything from God's Word when we read it. We're discouraged uh, or, or we're just benign. We're, we're, just, we're just neutral or spiritual almost. That, yeah, I know I'm saved, but, but I'm going through life and doing really what I want to do. And so it's time for a spiritual awakening in our lives. And the proof of that is that Jesus said in John 10, 10, that he's come to give us life and give it in abundance. He wants to give us an abundant life. And that doesn't mean abundant materially, necessarily. And usually it doesn't mean that. It means that God wants to experience us to experience the fullness of God in our life. He wants us to experience the fullness of Christ in our life. He wants to experience the fullness of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And we're not experiencing that because we're not in tune with what God is saying to us. We've not positioned ourselves to hear God speak to us. And so how do we position ourselves? I said last week, the first point is that we surrender our will to the will of God. We surrender our will to the will of God. 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7, we find that Peter writes, Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your care on him, because he cares about you. And here's the point. Most of us have surrendered ourselves to our worries and not to the will of God. We are controlled, we are consumed by our cares, our worries, our anxieties. And we're not surrendered to the will of God. We've given up. We've just said we've given in to the problems of our life. And they're controlling us and they're distracting us and keeping us from hearing God speak to us, which is exactly what Satan wants. That's what Satan's trying to do. He's trying to position you not to hear God speak. And the primary way that he does that is through the problem. He's just going to keep throwing problems at you. Three, keep throwing those issues at you where you get worked up. You get concerned about it. And it's consuming. And some of the things that you're dealing are, are major crises in your life. However, God is greater than your crisis. God is greater than the issue. God is greater than the problem. And God's going to enable you and empower you to stay above those. Oh, I'm, I'm doing okay under the circumstances. God doesn't want you to live there. He wants you to live above them. Above them. And so we have to position ourselves by being honest. This is what has happened. God, I, I, I'm not surrendered to your will. I'm surrendered to my will. And the proof of that is I'm trying to fix my problems, which God has allowed into your life to prove that very point. He's trying to prove that very point, that you're not surrendered to me, need to surrender. Now, when we do that, that means that God is walking with me. I'm experiencing God in my life. But I want you to be very careful about this statement, that God is walking with me. 
that God is with me. The Bible says that. God is with me. God will never leave me nor forsake me. But what is the Bible really saying? Step back for just a moment. The big picture is I'm walking with God. God isn't walking with me. Because what that means is, God, I'm going to go do this today. I hope you're with me. Be with me. Help me. And if we're not careful, that just becomes self-centered prayer. Self-serving prayer. And uh, I heard Charles Stanley make a great point about that this week. That often that's how we're living our lives. We're just asking God to go along with us in our walk. Rather than, I'm walking with God. I'm following God. Wherever God goes, that's where I go. Now, I'm going to work, but God's already there. God's always ahead of me. I'm going to school. God's ahead of me. God is there. So we need to be careful. I know what we're saying, but we need to be careful that all of our prayers are not about God following me where I'm going, but we're going where God is and where God's at work. And when we're there, then we're experiencing that spiritual awakening with God. That's positioning ourselves, surrendering to God's will. Maybe some of you need to do that today. You weren't here last Sunday. You need to surrender to God's will rather than your will. Secondly, how do we position ourselves? We release our passion toward God. We release our passion toward God. Passion is evidence of an authentic relationship. We talked about different venues in life where we see that, and, and it's true. If we're in love with Jesus Christ, there's passion, and passion evokes emotion. There's going to be something about our lives where people see the love of Christ in us and that we have for Him. Luke 10, 27, Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and body. With our entire being, we are passionate about Him. And what are we passionate about? We're, about, we're passionate about the song we just heard, Who He Is. His majesty, that was the first song we sang. And then what the choir just talked about was what he has done for us, which leads me to my very next point. All right, how do we position ourselves for a spiritual awakening? We surrender to God's will. We release our passion to God. Then third, we embrace God's grace. We embrace God's grace. Now, I'm primarily speaking to Christians this morning. Because we really don't understand the fullness of God's grace. We don't understand what that really means. And we're bound up. We're bound up so much so that we're not hearing God speak to us. We need to get back to a full understanding and the foundational work of God's grace. Titus chapter 3 verses 4 through 7. Great, great words. Great words about God's grace. Now follow along. What, in your Bible, if you have your Bible open, you need to mark this passage of Scripture and just put the word grace out next to it. Here it is. But when the goodness and love for man appeared from God, our Savior, He saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to His mercy through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. The Spirit He poured out on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior so that having been justified by His grace, we may become heirs with the hope of eternal life. There's the gospel right there. I ask you, give me a passage in the Bible that, that tells me the gospel. Right there's one of them. All right? Now notice all that God has done for us. That's what grace is. It's what God has done for us. It's because out of his character, out of his goodness, God did these things through us. And this salvation that we've experienced is not because of what we have done. It's not because of our works of righteousness. Not, not, being, not being a good moral person. Not doing good things. Because you still have the sin problem that we've inherited from Adam. You can do a lot of good things, philanthropy things and all the rest. But, but if you've not dealt with the sin problem, you're dead in your sin. You are guilty. You stand before God condemned and face His wrath. We don't like to use that word. One of the songs that the Gettys wrote, In Christ Alone. There's a certain denomination that's had heartburn because the word wrath is in that hymn, a, a contemporary hymn. We, we all sing it. We love it. We have those words in our kitchen on the wall. 
We don't like to talk about God's wrath. But you can't understand grace unless you understand wrath. And we stand condemned before a holy God because of our sin. But out of God's love for us, he says, his goodness and his love, he came to us through Jesus Christ. And what did he do? Out of his mercy, he washed us. He cleansed us of our sin through regeneration by being born again, being born spiritually. Born physically, now we're born again. We are born spiritually. And now we've entered into this relationship. The Holy Spirit's been poured out on us abundantly. Abundantly. Through Jesus Christ our Savior, being justified by His grace. We're right with God now because of the grace of God. All right, so that's what it means in salvation. But where's the problem? You see, God, grace is God's work, and that work brings freedom. When you see the word freedom, you need to put an equal sign. I mean, the word grace, put an equal sign and put freedom next to that. Grace equals freedom. Having a relationship with God doesn't mean it's rules and regulations and guilt and and legalism and performance. That's religion. That's religion. And that's what man has created and puts on men. And that's Jesus addressed that over and over and over again with the Pharisees. Read the gospel accounts. And what, what was Jesus addressing? You pile up burdens on men's shoulders. He told the Pharisees in one account. They can't live up under all the laws. And not just the law of God, but it's the interpretation of the law. It's all the rules that go along with the law. You know, we often relate to God based on our evaluation of ourselves, how we're doing. And if we're not doing well, then that's what we think God thinks about us. And we also are evaluating ourselves based on what other people have said about us. Did you have a father or a mother who defined you and you're defined today? Because of what they have said about you. I tell you, it just, it, it just breaks my heart to hear adults tell me what their parents told them as children. And, and, and they can't get past it. So they've defined themselves by what somebody else has said. Rather than what God has said about you. And we just believe that lie. We beat ourselves up. And we live in condem- self, self-condemnation. Because we're not living to the truth of God's word. God wants our relationship to be based on how he views us. How does he view you? He views you as someone that he created, that he loves. He loves you for who you are, not what you are. See, parents often get worked up about what you are. That's where we struggle sometimes. And, And that relationship is based on performance. One of the things that we drilled in our four children over and over and over again, we love you, we are proud of you for who you are. For who you are. And what does that mean? You're my kid, period. Nothing is going to change my love for you. You may, you may do some crazy things in this life, but I'm going to love you still. And when they did those things, they loved me. When I did those things, my parents still loved me. They were reflecting the love of God, that God loves us. And when we understand how great God's love for us, we live in freedom. When your kids understand that it's not based on performance, how well they do as a musician or how well they do in sports or how well they do academically, yeah, they need to be the best at what they do. But, but, but if they understand that that's what defines them, they're going to have problems. They're going to have emotional and spiritual problems in life, relational problems in life, because they're defined about what they are rather than who they are. And when we rest in the work of God's grace, it frees us. When a kid is resting in who he is because he's just in a relationship with his parents, there's freedom there. There's no legalism. There's no performance-based relationship. And so often in our understanding of God's grace and our relationship with God, we think it's about performance. 
Boy, if I don't have my Bible time every day, God's going to thump me. God ain't going to do that. If your heart is pure, well, I didn't do this today that I know I should do for God. Well, okay, then do it tomorrow. Now, if we're totally disconnected, God's going to get our attention. But if, if, if you love the Lord, you need to be free from the legalism and the rules and just rest in His grace that He has for you. Because I promise you, when you get to that point, you're going to find yourself experiencing a spiritual awakening. Now, two of the greatest enemies to our faith, as I mentioned, is condemnation. And a lack of understanding of God's Word. Either we don't know it or we don't understand it. When we sin, the enemy accuses us and we feel condemned. That guilt and shame robs us of the joy and the strength that we find in Christ. Again, many Christians view Christianity as a performance-based relationship. It's Satan's trap. We say it like this, if I perform well, God will be pleased with me and bless me. If I don't perform well, God is not going to like me. You see the huge jump? We jumped a big chasm right there. It's not just that God won't bless me, but now God doesn't like me. And that's where the enemy lies to us. How many, how many times have you heard the enemy say to you, God doesn't like you because you didn't do this and you didn't do this? How can God love you because you did this? Hey, and it might have been really bad, but God still loves you. God still loves you. doesn't matter what's happened. Instead of encountering God, we encounter failure, which leads to condemnation, which leads to apathy. Why? We're focused on performance. i got to look good on the outside. We're focused on the external, not the internal. The focus is on works instead of God's grace. And as we see here in this passage in Titus, grace is simply the goodness of God. You see, the reason we love God is because He first loved us, the Bible says. He came to us, and that's why we love Him. Romans 8, 1. Notice this verse. Therefore... No condemnation now exists for those in Christ Jesus. Now, I want us to say that together, all right? Repeat that out loud. Therefore, no condemnation now exists for those in Christ Jesus. Now, we need to believe that. The question is, are you in Christ Jesus positionally? Do you have a relationship with Christ? If you are in Christ, you are no longer condemned. You'll never be condemned. Nothing could possibly happen for you to be condemned by God. Nothing. Nothing. You stand before Him as a child of God. You've been adopted into His family. That's the whole beauty about what we saw a few minutes ago. It is the clearest picture of our relationship with God. We've been adopted into Him, and we call Him now Abba Father, Daddy. We're in that relationship with Him. When I focus on God's grace and not my performance, that frees me to love Him and serve Him all the more. That positions me for a spiritual awakening. We need to come to a greater understanding of what God's grace really means. Because then, if you're, if you're bound up in legalism and performance, Satan's got you right where he wants you, where you will not hear God speak when he's trying to get your attention. You're going to miss him. He's going to show up, and he's going to go, and you'll never have missed. You'll never have heard him. You'll miss him. That's spiritual awakening. All right, the last one. How do I position myself for spiritual awakening? We do that by creating space for God. Creating space for God. Now, there are three specific ways that I want to help you understand that. I've kind of said that in general, and, 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 and these are the ways that we need to. But now I want to get real specific. And we're going to anchor in on these over the next two weeks. All right. One I'll just allude to today. But there are two that we're going to, we're going to hit hard the next two weeks. All right. What is that? You want God to do something? You want God to do something in your life. But have you created space for Him to do so? 
The Bible helps us understand how to do that. Matthew chapter 6. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 5, 6, and 7 is known as the Sermon on the Mount. The greatest sermon that's ever been preached. The greatest teaching that anyone has ever experienced has come under the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ in this great sermon. I've had the privilege of standing on that mountain three times looking, overlooking the Sea of Galilee. It's a beautiful place. It's very easy to see how thousands would have been there to hear Christ uh, speak, speak to the masses and share this great sermon. Matthew chapter 6, verse 3. Now there's a pattern that we're going to see in these three passages. They're all in Matthew 6. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father who sees you will reward you. Matthew 6, 6. But when you pray, go into your private room, shut your door, and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Matthew 6, 17. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face so that you don't show your fasting to people but to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Now, what are the three ways that we create space for God? We give, we pray, and we fast. Now, what do we mean by creating space? Have you ever added a room to your house? Why did you add that room to your house? To fill it. You had a purpose in mind. You created space to fill the space. Just think about all those places in your life where you've created space. You created space to fill the space. And that's what we're talking about here. In giving, in praying, and fasting, you're creating space so that space can be filled by God. Now, the first way, I want you to notice. He says, when you do these things. When you give, when you pray, and when you fast. What is Jesus saying? He's assuming that that is a regular, steady diet of spiritual food in our life. It's not something we do occasionally as a spiritual discipline. That, that's something we do all the time. Now, in this day and time, the Jews fasted on a regular basis. The Jews gave on a regular basis. The Jews prayed, and Jesus had to address all these things. Matthew 6 is one of the, one of the reasons why he addressed it. It's because they didn't understand it. They were doing it to be self-serving. And he's addressing the real reason why they need to be giving, praying, and fasting. So he's, he's helping us understand that you create this space. It is something that we regularly do. Now, I dare say that there are people in this, in this room who haven't given. You've not prayed, or you're not praying as you should, and you've never fasted. You've never fasted from food. You've never fasted with the intent, not of a diet, but of hearing from God, creating space for God. Now, I want you to notice the second thing that is in all three of these, that it's done in secret. The word secret there literally means set apart. It means to be set apart. So I'm getting to a place where I experience God in the secret place. I'm giving, I'm praying, and I'm fasting. I'm doing that alone. Notice he said when you fast, he said, take a bath. Fix your hair, put your makeup on, dress, you know, whatever. That's the intent there. Don't walk around with sackcloth and ashes and, and, and oh, I'm fasting. Let everybody know how spiritual you are by telling them you're fasting. No. When you're praying, there are places to pray in public. We do it here on Sunday. But if this is the only place you're praying, there's problems. You pray in the Sunday school class, the life group class, you stand up here and pray before the offering. But if you're not praying every day, this means nothing. It's in the secret places. There's time when you've got to shut the door and you get alone. We need to create that aloneness with God. We're creating space so God can fill that space. Let's talk about the first one, giving. All right? Tithing creates space for God and your finances, as well as giving your offerings. Here we find giving to the poor. 
So there are different ways that we give. And when we're giving, we're creating space for God. Think about it. God's loaned you your money. You didn't create it. God's loaned you that money. You're a steward of what he's given you. You didn't create your children. God's loaned them to you for a season of time. And God's given you a certain amount of money that he's loaned you, and you're to be a wise steward of that money. And so when I just think of a, a, a cup that's, that's uh, all the way to the top full of coins, I take 10% out, and I give it to God. I've created space for God to work. And, and look, the reward is not necessarily money. It could be a spiritual awakening about something else. God may bless you financially. And, and, but, but there are greater rewards than that. And so we position ourselves for God to move in our finances. Secondly, he says that we are to pray. Praying creates space for God, Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in you. Again, God's reward is not necessarily saying yes to your request. God, the, the, that, that through prayer, God's going to reveal something totally different to you. I've, I've experienced that several times. I'm praying about a certain thing, and I want it to happen a certain way, but God in that praying for that particular situation or person, God does something different. But positioning myself in prayer allowed me to hear God. I created space for God to pray by praying. But it, it was something else he wanted to reveal to me in praying. Fasting is something else that we do to create space for God. And this is the tough one. This is where it's hard for us to really see God work in our lives because we don't like to fast. We don't like to give up food. Now, there's a lot to say about that, but I'll move on. Saying no to food allows us to create space for God and to hear from Him. So we give, we pray, and we fast. We're creating space because, listen, how many of you would just say, Bill, my life is just so busy, so busy, so busy? There's a great book. Um, I'll think of the guy's name because it's just now coming to me. He wrote it. It's, uh, it's, a, it's for men, and it's about margin. It's called Margin. Have you ever read a book and there's no margins? It's just words starting on the left and going all the way across the page to the right? Of course you have it. Because a book is designed so you don't read it like that. There are margins to create space. Just to give your mind a, a, a moment break as you go to read the next line and continue. And many of us live lives with no margins in our books. I mean, we've just consumed the page. Busyness, busyness, busyness. And there's no time for God. So we create space. We create space. I have to do that as a pastor. Man, I can be consumed with the busyness of church work. It's good work. It's great work. But I can be so consumed with that that I miss God. I'm not creating space to hear God speak to me. You know, I say this often, but folks, there's too much at stake for you not to hear from God. You've got too much in your hands, too much in your responsibility not to hear from God. You need to know what is it that God is saying to you. You want to do the right thing in your life. And you might sit here today and say, well, I've got a good life. But is that the best life? Is that really what God intended with your life? Is that really what God intended to do with your life is where you are today. And you may be in a good place. You may not be. But we missed him. We're going to stand before him in heaven and he's going to say to us, you didn't create any space for me to help you understand who I am and how I want to use you for my kingdom's glory and purpose. You just filled the page with your agenda 
and had no concern for my agenda, which is so much better for you and for our church. We just had a staff retreat I mentioned a couple weeks ago. Last Sunday I mentioned it. This is one of the things that we addressed, the busyness of the church. We're going through every one of our ministries. If it's a dead, sacred cow, no more. If it's not fulfilling the purpose of this church, we're not going to do those things. Just because we're doing them. We're going to do what God is leading us to do. We are positioning ourselves to hear from God. So that I don't stand before God one day and He said, That was it? That's, that, that's what you thought about church? That, that, that's not what I had in mind. But you didn't create space to hear me speak to you. So we're being very intentional right now as a staff and as a deacon council, your leadership team. What are we supposed to be doing? It affects us personally. It affects us as a church. Are we maximizing the resources and the opportunities that God has given us to invite all people to become committed followers of Jesus Christ? Are we maximizing that opportunity? And so you need to pray for us, that God will give us the wisdom that we need to do that. We need time alone with God. It's time for a spiritual awakening. Would you not admit? And we position ourselves by surrendering to God's will, releasing our passion for God, embracing God's grace, and creating space for Him. As Jesus said, I have come to give you life and to give it more abundantly. An abundant life, far greater than you could ever imagine, God wants you to experience. The next two weeks, I'm going to anchor in on a couple of these points that are going to position us to create space for God. Let's pray. Father, I thank you this morning for speaking to our hearts through your word and Lord, I pray that we will be willing to do what you're challenging us to do. As a follower of Christ, as the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we would position ourselves to experience a spiritual awakening that is not extraordinary, it is ordinary. It's something that is continual. Is something that is not abnormal, it's normal in our life. Just to experience you in our walk with you. And every day we sense the freshness of our relationship with you. And Lord, there's some who were here this morning when I opened up the passage in Titus. For the first time, something happened in their spirit where they've come to understand their need for Christ. To know that they stand before you condemned because of their sin, but out of your great grace and mercy, your love, you offer them the opportunity to have that sin cleansed, washed away, forgiven, and enter into a relationship with you both now and forever. And I pray they'll simply just follow the leading of your spirit to say yes. And come by faith, trusting you that that's what you did. We weren't there when it happened. But by faith, we believe it did happen. As you have revealed yourself to us by your spirit. Lord, many in this room would say they know you, but they desire a spiritual awakening. They just don't know how to get there. And I pray that, that today that they know now what they need to do that you've already spoken to that place in their heart where they need to position themselves to hear you speak to them. Help us, God. Help us to do what we need to do now, to position ourselves to experience your fullness in our lives. It's a good place. Good things will happen as we yield ourselves to you now. In Jesus' name, amen.